may be seated. I love that, the poetry of that third verse. His very word of grace is strong as that which built the skies. When you think of the grace of God extended to you, think of the voice that spoke and all of heaven and earth and all the universe came into existence. His very word of grace is as strong as his word that built the skies. The voice that rolls the stars along speaks all the promises, the promises of God to you. Think of the mighty voice that rolls every star along. That's the voice that speaks God's promises to you. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago out of the book of Exodus. And as you're turning there, remember, we're learning the ten plagues. We've seen blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, or cattle plague, boils, hails, locusts, and today we'll be looking at darkness. And coming your way soon in more ways than one, death. And we've learned a little budak so that we can remember the ten plagues in order. Do you remember the budak? Blood is blow, fro is frogs, lie is lice, fly is fly, moo is cattle, bow is boils, hay is for hail, low is for locusts, Darkness is da, and death is d. So it's blow fro, lie fly, halo, and da d. Let's see if we can say them together. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bow, halo, and da d. <laughs> well, maybe you'll get it one of these days. Okay, we're in Exodus chapter 10. We read verses 21 through 29 a few moments ago, and you'll recall that we've made a comparison with these last three plagues to hospice care. Here is Egypt going on hospice care. Number one, the removal of all life-sustaining nourishment. That was locusts ate everything that the hail didn't destroy. Then we find the shutting down of the organs when all life-sustaining nourishment, they pull the plug and they just wet your lips a little bit. The shutting down of the organs, the darkening of the eyes, the darkening of the mind, the darkening of the body, the irreversible coma, the darkness. That's what we're looking at today. And finally, the final termination when the body shuts down. Death. Removal of life-sustaining nourishment, shutting down of the organs, final termination. Death. That's coming. It's coming for Egypt. Someday it's coming for you. I hope you're ready. Some of us might not walk out of this auditorium today. We might drop dead. We need to understand that. We think it'll never happen. It's coming. It's coming. Now, the final lesson that we learned as we looked at the plague of locusts is this. Locusts are usually seen in the Bible as a sign of the most severe warning judgments of God. God is telling Pharaoh... And we saw this many, many places in both the Old Testament and the New Testament where we saw finally the book of Revelation with those demonic locusts that are released near the end of the trumpet judgments, which is shortly before the end of the tribulation for the last bowl judgments take place in a week's period of time. So the, the trumpet judgments are bringing us up to the last week of the period of time of the seven years of the great tribulation period. And we found the demonic locusts being loosed on the earth. They are a sign of the most severe warning judgments of God. And we saw that locusts were for Israel an illustration of the law of harvest, a principle clearly restated in the New Testament. The picture is about sowing crops. And we suggest you think of locusts eating the crops when you read Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And we noted how easy it is to get weary in well-doing. But God guarantees that we will reap what we sow. 
And so that led us to a study of the law of harvest. And remember, harvest relates to work. Salvation relates to faith. But harvest relates to works. And we saw many illustrations of that. We closed out with Revelation chapter 20. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And in chapter 22, Jesus says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, if you're at the great white throne judgment, you're not saved. Your name's not in the book of life. You see, believers are judged at the bema seat of Christ. That takes place after the rapture in heaven while the tribulation is going on on earth. So what we find showing up at the end of the book of Revelation is the great white throne judgment, where the unbelievers are being judged. But not only are their names not in the book of life, it says there are other books, and they're judged according to their works. The level of punishment will be determined by their works, just as the level of reward is determined by the works of the believers. Paul says so over in 1 Corinthians 3, 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Chapter 3, verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. That's the rewards of the believer. Believers get rewards based on their works. Their salvation is based on faith. But their rewards are based on works, just like the level of judgment that the unbelievers are going to get is based on their works as well. We need to be careful what we're doing. Paul exhorts us that we should look for the blessed hope. Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from an all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. In chapter 3, verse 8, there's a faithful saying, And these things that thy will, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, prove what you believe, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Titus 3.14, he says, says it several times in the book of Titus, you might have guessed that. Let ours also to learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. And it's clear that he's not talking about salvation because he says in verse 5 of that same chapter, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And then we had an extended discussion, you recall, out of James chapter 2 on the difference between justification and imputation. Justification means to declare righteous. Imputation means to transfer from one account to another. It's a bookkeeping term, and in this context... The transfer of guilt and righteousness are simply to make righteous when we're speaking about imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. In the sight of God, we are justified, that is, we are declared righteous by faith alone. But in the sight of men who cannot see our faith without our works, we are declared righteous by our works. James 2.18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you. He's speaking to another man. I will show you my faith by my works. Peter says the same thing. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, now get the next phrase, which they shall behold. Glorify God in the day of visitation. The point was, we made was that works and harvest are connected. Pharaoh had to learn that lesson the hard way when God sent the plague of locusts that utterly destroyed his harvest. And then we talked about well, what do you do if you find your harvest is being destroyed? What do you do because that happens because of sin? And the solution when destruction comes because of sin, the solution is repentance. Locusts, the symbol of destruction of the harvest, are one of the ways that God uses to lead us to repentance. So the next lesson that we learned from the plague of locusts was there are three types of judgment. There's temporary judgment, there's tribulational judgment, and there is terminal judgment. 
Those are the principal lessons from the plague of locusts that are reiterated over and over and over again in the Bible. We saw that from Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, that locusts are one of the many judgments sent by God to specifically reveal what's in your heart. Solomon says so at the dedication. He says, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, and this is right after he's talked about the locusts, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man. <laughs> and here we get back to this business of works according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. And we saw that again tied in with the New Testament law of harvest out of Galatians chapter 6. Then we looked at locusts in relation to the future promises to Israel that when they repent as a nation, repentance, you remember, is always the key to relieving the destruction that comes in that law of harvest. We did an overview of Joel 2, which Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost, concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit after the description of the day of the Lord in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The day of the Lord begins immediately after the rapture, includes the seven-year great tribulation period in the millennium. All of that was originally prophesied for national Israel when the church was still a mystery. That's the reason that the coming of the Holy Spirit is seen in the context of the day of the Lord in Joel chapter 2, and the church is not in view at all in Joel chapter 2. That large insertion of the church out of every nation was not revealed in the Old Testament. We proved that by looking at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, where Paul talks about it as a mystery. And you recall, I'm going to ask you the question again, because I've told you this many times. The term mystery, and Paul just defines it for us in Ephesians 3, something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. There are how many mysteries in the New Testament? Well, I think I heard it. Seventeen. When you track the word mystery through the New Testament, there are 17 specific mysteries in the New Testament that were not revealed in the Old Testament that are now revealed unto the whole apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. And he reveals that here, that we as Gentiles would be fellow heirs unto the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ by the gospel. And he calls that a mystery. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and heavenly places. And you know he uses those terms in Ephesians chapter 6 to speak about the angelic demonic warfare. Satan and his demonic hosts in their various orders and echelons of authority in the, in the spiritual realm. They didn't know it. The angels didn't know it. What God was going to do now during this period of time in which we live. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of of God. That helped us to understand why the prophecy in Joel 2, why it includes things in the same context that are separated by at least 2,000 years. The millennium is a restoration to Israel when they come to national repentance during the last three days of the tribulation. We talked about that in detail in Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. The prophecy of the restoration of national Israel upon repentance is the same in Joel. We saw those parallel passages. Finally, that brought us to the plague of locusts and the prophecies of the book of Revelation, where we find all the plagues of Egypt magnified. Every one of the plagues of Egypt is re-seen in the book of Revelation. And I think that the two witnesses who are there are Moses and Elijah. Moses' death, you know, was very, very strange, and the book of Jude talks about that. Now, Mark, Michael the archangel, when he contended with the body of Moses uh, with the devil, durst not bring a railing accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. God himself buried Moses. Some strange things about that, and yet we find in the book of Revelation there are two witnesses who can bring all kinds of plagues and call down fire from heaven. And you recall Elijah was the other one. He also went up to heaven. He didn't go in the chariot. What did he go up in? The whirlwind. That's right. The chariot separated Elijah and Elisha, but Elijah went to heaven in the whirlwind. And Elijah could call down fire from heaven as he did. When they came to arrest him, he was sitting on top of the hill, and the captain of the 50s and his 50s went up there and got fried. Elijah called down fire from heaven. <laughs> Second group went up. They got fried. Elijah called down fire from heaven. Third group went up, and that captain fell on his face and said, please spare my life, you know. And God said to him, okay, Elijah, you can go with this guy. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation, some supernatural things are going to be happening in the book of Revelation, tying us back to the Old Testament, and I think tying us back clearly to the ten plagues of Egypt, because you find all ten of those plagues restated in the book of Revelation, but in a much more furious manner than you see them happening even to Pharaoh, and to the Egyptian people. 
as with the other plagues, a more deadly kind of locusts were found in the book of Revelation. Locusts appear in the second set of judgments, the trumpet judgments, the first of the seal judgments, that takes the first three and a half years of the tribulation. The second of the trumpet judgments, that's the second three and a half years of the tribulation up to the final week. And finally, there are the bowl judgments, or the vials, that are poured out during the last week of the tribulation and leading to the national repentance of Israel. The those judgments intensify through the three specific stages. Locusts appear near the end of the second stage, which means they are coming up toward the end of the tribulation period. The fifth angel sounded, that's he blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of the great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. We're going to talk about the plague of darkness today. It's tied together with this. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them, and here they're different from the locusts of, of the ten plagues, because it says it was commanded unto them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Those are supernatural demonic locusts out of the bottomless pit. They have a different target. The people who have not the seal of God in their forehead. And it talks about the shapes of the locusts and it says how long they're going to be around. It tells you what they can do and we know that they're demonic forces because it says so in verse 11. They have a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue he hath named the Polyon. That's the destroyer. One woe is past and behold there come two more woes hereafter. We also looked at the sixth trumpet judgment which has much similar demonic activity to those locusts and saw the concluding verse, verse 21, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. And verse 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. You see the key, the key to the locusts is repentance. When God is destroying your harvest, the key is repentance. When you find there is sin in your life and you insist on it and stubbornly refuse to do what God wants you to do and you keep moving forward in sin, God's going to send locusts into your life. And he's going to destroy the works of your hands. And folks, I think judgment is coming on the church because we have focused on the temporal things instead of on the eternal things. The temporal things are the things that are seen the eternal things are the things that are not seen. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with God in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Wherefore, mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, and inordinate affection, and concupiscence. All the other things that Paul lists in Colossians chapter 3. You see, they repented not. Pharaoh repented not. And so, after Pharaoh repented not, and the locust destroyed everything, then God sent darkness. The judgment of darkness. And we see that's what's happening here in the book of Revelation as well. So that brings us to verses 21 through 29. Pharaoh was not too bright. Or dim bulbs in Egypt, it was dark. Part one. The darkness, first of all, was the supernatural presence of the Shekinah glory. We need to understand something. God dwells in what is termed the Shekinah. It's a Hebrew word, Shekinah. It means the dwelling place. The Shekinah glory, the glory of God. That's the place that God dwells. I'd love to take you to John chapter 12 where Jesus is the one who is in the Shekinah and it quotes Isaiah to say so. But we'll, we'll leave that for another time. But the Shekinah glory is the dwelling place of God. We're going to see today, as we look at the Shekinah glory and what it does here in the plague of darkness and what it is going to do in the future, what it did in the days of Abraham, what it did later at Mount Sinai, what is prophesied that it will do. And it relates to judgment for one and blessing for another. Fascinating. The darkness was the supernatural presence of the Shekinah glory. Exodus chapter 14, jump two chapters ahead, uh, four chapters ahead, excuse me. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Now, they're at the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army are coming over the crest. 600 chariots screaming for blood. Children of Israel are terrified. 
Pharaoh's let him go. But Pharaoh says, I'm going to get him. They killed my firstborn. They killed the next Pharaoh who's going to sit on the throne. I'm going to kill him. The children of Israel are terrified. Scared out of their wits. Moses says, don't worry about it. Wait and see what God's going to do. The pillar that's been leading them goes from in front of them and goes behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Now listen. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. What was the darkness in Egypt? It was dark. In fact, the first verse that we read said that it could be felt. It was so dark, they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. It says it was so dark they didn't even dare to move for three days. It means nobody was eating, nobody was drinking, everybody was sitting there terrified out of their gourd. They were scared stiff. It was a supernatural darkness. It tells us what made that darkness because it tells us here in chapter 14. Did you notice also that in the land of Goshen there was light? It was darkness to one, it was light to the other. You know, there's coming a place someday where there's going to be darkness for one and light for others. We'll talk about that. Gives us some insights into what hell's going to be like and what heaven's going to be like. And all of it's in the presence of God, for he's omnipresent. Psalm 18 speaks of God, and it speaks of him in the connection with darkness. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. It's a place of judgment. We don't have to be afraid as believers because he says, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Psalm 97 says, clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. It's a picture of judgment. Psalm, 90, uh, Psalm 104, verse 20. Thou makest darkness and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forests do creep forth. <laughs> There's some scary things in the dark, aren't there? Psalm 105, he sent darkness, he made it dark, and they rebelled not against his word. When God sends the darkness, they don't move. Psalm 107, such as sit in darkness in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. It's a picture of a prison. It's a picture of the shadow of death hovering over you. That's the next plague in Egypt. When they're in darkness, they're in the shadow of death, which is plague number 10. Psalm 112.4, under the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. That's the land of Goshen. There's that picture for you. Darkness precedes death. Darkness is a picture in scripture of spiritual blindness and of sin and of spiritual death, which is like lifelessness before creation. Remember, that's how we started in Genesis 1. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And the way of the wicked is darkness. They know not of what they stumble. Whoso curses his father or mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. A wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth unto them all, that is death. You know, the Bible says a lot about darkness. If you want to read a lot about darkness, read the book of Isaiah. Isaiah speaks of darkness more frequently than any other of the Old Testament prophets. I'm not going to read you all those verses. Let me just give you a couple of other ones. 
Here's what the days of the unregenerate man are like out of the book of Ecclesiastes. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. Ecclesiastes 5.17, all his days also he eateth in darkness. He hath much sorrow and wrath in his sickness. Chapter 6, for he cometh in in vanity and departeth in darkness. His name shall be covered with darkness. Ecclesiastes 11, but if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for there shall be many. But God provides light in the darkness, even as he did for the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Isaiah chapter 29, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. These are messianic prophecies. I wish we had time to study them more in detail, but it would take forever to just get through the plague of darkness if we did that. Isaiah chapter 42, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Remember, we saw that in the previous verses out of the book of Psalms. Isaiah 42, 16, I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do and not forsake them. And then a ver verse that you know from Handel's Messiah. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Jesus spoke of darkness as spiritual blindness. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is also full of darkness. And then one verse later he says, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. What kind of darkness? He tells us in John chapter 3. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Darkness is also a picture of the judgment during the day of the Lord. We read last week out of Joel chapter 2. I'll give you just two verses as a reminder. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A people great and strong that hath not been the like, neither shall there evermore be like it even unto the years of many generations. In verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. We see these things happening in Revelation. We'll not go through all those passages again, but Amos chapter 5, same thing. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Verse 20, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Zephaniah 1.15, that day, the day of the Lord, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Remember where the Lord makes his habitation? The darkness and thick clouds. When you see him portrayed that way, you see him being portrayed as the God of judgment. Peter quotes that passage out of Joel chapter 2 that we just read in Acts chapter 2 verse 20. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. It's coming. Peter refers to it as future. Peter's not joking about it. Peter's not allegorizing it. Peter's not mythologizing it. It is reality and it's coming. And God will judge the earth. That darkness could be felt. It's sort of like you swim in water. You can feel the water when you submerged in it. Well, think of darkness. Think of being at the very bottom of the ocean with a crushing darkness around you. It's what it was like in Egypt. The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Did you know somebody had experienced that darkness before this? In fact, somebody very important in the Bible. Somebody that we're supposed to emulate. Abraham had felt the horror of darkness before God cut the Abrahamic covenant with him. And now you see in Egypt, God is about to fulfill that covenant. So he gave that horror of darkness a taste of it to Pharaoh. Now remember, Ra 
was the sun god and he was the principal god of Egypt and God said, I'm just going to put out your principal god. He's not going to give you even a glimmer of light. Ra, the sun, remember these judgments are all judgments against the gods of Egypt and went through all the different ten judgments and all the different gods of Egypt that they were specifically judging and what Israel was, uh, what Egypt was hoping from each of these gods and how God said, they're not going to help you, they're not going to help you, they're not going to help you. In fact, they're, they're nothing compared to me. Plague of darkness. Ra, the principal god. The one who always rode between the horns of Apis, the bull god. Back in the cattle murrain, you remember? We talked about Apis. And now that son, which they thought was their principal god, he's cut out. Total blackness. But Abraham had felt the horror of darkness. Genesis chapter 15. We find the Abrahamic covenant is stated for us in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and Genesis 21 where it's restated. But here God is actually cutting the covenant. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. In other words, if he didn't have a son, the guy who was the chief servant got it all. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, by the way, who is the word of the Lord? Jesus in John chapter 8 says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus jumps from Abraham to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, and Jesus says, Before Abraham was, Ego emi, I am. God had said to Moses at the burning bush, Take off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And he said, I am that I am hath sent me unto thee. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto thee. And Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. And it says, And the Jews took up stones to stone him. They recognized he was claiming to be Jehovah, who spoke to Moses. Not only did he claim to be Jehovah, who spoke to Abraham. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. That's John 8. But he's also claiming to be the one who spoke to Moses. The one who is the I am. The one who is the God who led them out of Egypt. The one who caused the plagues. The one who led them through the wilderness. The one who led them into the promised land. Jesus was claiming it. They said, you're a blasphemer. And they took up stones to stone him. So here's Abraham, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the one speaking to him. The word of the Lord came unto him, and the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's imputation. James quotes that. Paul quotes it in Romans. Paul quotes it in Galatians. That's imputation. Imputation of righteousness comes by faith. Justification, which is the declaration of righteousness. Declaration, God sees our faith and he declares us righteous. Men see our faith and they declare us righteous. They see it by our works. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give this land to inherit it. Huh. Oh, we've spent a lot of time on that. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, now here we have the cutting of the covenant. He said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon and he took unto him all these, and he divided them in the midst. He cut them in half. He laid each piece one against another. He split them right down the middle, and he laid them out flat. The blood is running down between these pieces. Did you notice there are five animals? I'm not going to push numerology, but five is the number of grace. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now listen to verse 12. 
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, that is, the word of the Lord, said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Where was that? That's Egypt. Here's a promise of a covenant concerning the land, but it's a promise that your descendants are going to live in Egypt for 400 years. God takes the horror of darkness that Abraham experienced, and God brings in the plague of darkness. And lets Pharaoh experience it, but gives light unto Israel because he's about to redeem, he's about to deliver, he's about to cut the Red Sea and bring them over dry shod and destroy Pharaoh's army. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Now listen, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. You know what happens next in the text? After the plague of death, they borrow of all the Egyptians. They get paid for their 400 years of bondage. They go out with great substance. God prophesied it back in the days of Abraham, 2000 B.C. And now we're about 1445 B.C. with the Exodus. It took a long time for that to come about, but God fulfilled his word prophetically, exactly, literally, precisely. That's the way he always fulfills prophecy. He doesn't do it mystically. He doesn't do it allegorically. The things that we see in the book of Revelation are the same way. Those are things that are coming, and they're coming upon this earth, and God will judge because they refuse to repent. Oh, that we might learn to repent when we sin. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now listen, listen to this, listen to this. Verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. That's the Shekinah glory of God. That's what came and stood between Israel and the Egyptians. And it was darkness so thick you could feel it and they couldn't move from their places all night long in the Egyptian camp. And it was light to the children of Israel. It was darkness in Egypt and light in the land of Goshen. It's the Shekinah glory of God. And God walks between the pieces. You know what cutting a covenant means? It means if I don't keep the covenant... And I walk between those pieces and I dip my feet in that blood as I walk between the pieces that are spread on both sides. If I don't keep this covenant, you can do to me what's been done to these animals. Abraham didn't walk between those pieces. He was scared stiff too, but God did. God said, I'm going to keep my covenant and I'm going to prove it to you by something you understand. And God himself in the Shekinah glory walked between the pieces of the sliced animals. The horror of the great darkness, the smoking furnace, the burning lamp, peace clasped between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That has never been fulfilled in the history of Israel. The river of Egypt is the Nile River. It's not that little wadi down at the bottom of Israel. It's the Nile River. He's talking about them going down to Egypt and serving in Egypt. And so I'm going to give you the land from the, the river of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates River. Huge piece of territory. Israel's never yet gotten it, but Israel will get it during the millennial kingdom of Christ. Don't try to allegorize it away. Don't try to make it smaller. We have a big God, people. We have a God who makes covenants and a God who keeps covenants and a God who guarantees it with blood. And that's what he did on the cross with Jesus. He will never break his covenants. He is our God. He is our living God. He's the God who has made all the promises to us. The voice that rolls the stars along speaks all the promises as we just sang. Our time is up. I can't believe this. I knew I was going to have to preach more than one week on darkness. I'll give you one illustration, then we'll close. Many years ago, when I was a child, our family 
I drove out west. And we, we often drove to California back in the days when there was no air conditioning. Uh, and it's hot driving across the southwest. But we stopped on one of those trips. We went to California because that's where my grandparents lived. And we stopped in Carlsbad Caverns. And, um, you know, there are lots of interesting things in Carlsbad. In fact, you sit there in the evening and the, the guy, the National Park Ranger, stands there and he talks about the bats that are going to come out of the cave. And so you're sitting on this hillside, sort of an amphitheater, and soon bats begin to come out until you can hardly see the sky. It's so black. Millions of bats coming out. How many of you think bats are a little bit creepy? <laughs> I think so, yeah, yeah. Especially if they start swirling around you. If you've got bugs in your hair, bugs flying out of your hair, you know what the bats are going to go for? They're going to be flying around you. We saw millions of bats, and then we went down into the cave. And it's lighted as you go down, and you go down, and down, and down, and down, and down, and down. Nice walking path, and there are beautiful lights, and they're showing all the different stalactites and stalagmites and the special cave formations. And the guide is telling you about all the different kinds of blind creatures that live in the cave. And, you know, you're enjoying it, and then you... And at the very bottom, they've actually got a restaurant down at the very bottom where you can eat your lunch for a very high price. But at one point, you come into a room and the guide says, now I want you all to sit down because I'm going to turn out the lights. Everybody finds a seat and they sit down and they turn out the lights. And you have never been in a place so dark in your life. And you do not dare move because you don't know how close you are to somebody else or what you might trip into or fall into a hole or bump into a wall and bang your head. If you've ever been in a cave like that, I think they probably do that at Luray Caverns and others along the Shenandoah Range. Darkness. The plague of darkness. Now, you know, down in Carlsbad, the temperature is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It's consistently that temperature all over the United States below 10 feet below the surface of the earth and it stays that way consistently 55 degrees but you know the darkness in Egypt was a hot darkness did you know the darkness in hell because that's how hell is also described is a hot darkness and it's in a fire that burns but does not consume do you remember the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3? Moses turned aside to see this site. He said, it's a wonder because here's a bush that's on fire. It's burning, but it is not consumed. The kind of glory has some fascinating character qualities, but we'll have to save that for future weeks. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. And for what you were teaching, not only Egypt, but Israel, and through Egypt and Israel teaching us and teaching for the last days the darkness that is coming as one of your great judgments upon the earth. Not merely during the tribulation period, but a darkness that is coming for eternity for those who will not, who refuse to believe, who harden their hearts, who shake their fists in the face of Almighty God, who repent not of their fornications and murders and thefts and sorceries and idolatries, who refuse to admit that Jesus is Lord and he is the one who is the judge of all the earth. Father, we pray that you'll take the things that we have studied today and use them to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, to our edification, to our warning, to a reminder for us to walk in holiness and purity all the days of our life, that when we sin, to repent of it immediately, to confess it as sin, to turn from it, that all those things for which we have worked be not destroyed, that we be not plunged into darkness where we're wandering about, wondering what we should do next. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 6.